I said to somebody as we were uh, gathering here, it's from one controversy to another. So here we are. Uh, this passage uh, is, we are in 1 Corinthians, and you may, uh, may want to have your Bible open. I can't remember. I think yes. Because we are going to have some of the verses on our screen, but you're going to want to be in 1 Corinthians 12. We will be referring to some other passages. I can't remember what all, excuse me, I put on the screen. But, um, but we do want to uh, start dealing with this passage. As I said this morning in the uh, announcement time that, um, that we're going to slow down here. Like I've been going pretty, pretty fast for me going through passages. But this is, a current, this is an issue that is actually current in churches. And there's a lot of confusion. And I was looking at my notes from 1998 when I preached through 1 Corinthians before. And I thought, you know, we, I don't want to just turn this into a preaching session. So I'm going to use those notes and try to turn it into a Bible study session. Uh, hopefully it will be successful. Uh, there, I, I'm, I'm probably not going to follow exactly what I did back in 1998, but this first lesson is pretty close to what we did. And I think it will be helpful to set the stage. Uh, I think, as I look back, there were like, I think there were seven messages from 1 Corinthians 12 alone back then. So sometimes you can sort of lose the forest for the trees. Uh, but I'll try not to do that. But we're going to we're going to stop here. Or we're going to slow down in this particular section. All right. And so I'm uh, just going to give you the outline at the st at the start. And we're starting to I'm starting to take some of the uh, things out of the outline. I guess I didn't do it on the screen, but I had it in your notes. I took the A and B under number two out, just to give a little bit more room on the page. So we covered all these things, the conditions that were reported to Paul, questions asked of Paul, that's the section we're in. We're finally now in the section on questions about worship services, so we talked about head coverings, communion practices, and now it's the spiritual gifts. And so today, what we're doing is introducing the spiritual gifts. And this is a topic that really for 121 years, basically, has created a great deal of division in the church. Now, there's, there haven't always been uh, people who would be similar to what we now have as charismatic Christians. There were periods of church history where little fringe groups would have some manifestations of this kind of teaching, but for the most part, it was absent into the church until 1902. Okay, so follow what I'm saying. For the most part, other than a few little fringe groups, the teaching about the charismatic gifts was primarily absent from the church until 1902. Since 1902, it began as a sort of a small sect, not a very influential group, where, to where now today, uh, in the National Association of Evangelicals in the States, the majority of churches are charismatic churches. Okay, so that's the kind of shift that it has taken. It has caused a great deal of division amongst Christians. And we have to, and when we're considering it, we have to ask the question, is the division legitimate? Uh, is it something that, you know, when we people promote something as being taught in the Bible, is it something that we should agree that is taught in the Bible, or should we repudiate it and reject it? And of course, if you've been with us for a long time, you know that I am not a supporter of the, the charismatic teaching that is taught amongst uh, those groups. Uh, so, as I say, I, I, I plan to slow down. So here is lesson one, introducing the topic, Introdu introducing spiritual gifts. And uh, we're gonna, I'm going to put the passage, the first three verses of the chapter up. This is as far as we're going to get, three verses today. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, 
Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So those are the first three verses. He's opening up the topic. Uh, And so under the need for instruction, I do not want you to be what? I've left a blank there. Unaware. What does the King James say? Ignorant. Ignorant. All right. I do not want you to be ignorant. All right. So what is the subject of ignorance? What does he want them not to be ignorant about? Spiritual gifts. And you'll notice that the word gifts is in italics. It's actually the word spiritual. The word spiritual is an adjective, and it's in a plural. So you could translate it, the spirituals. I do not, now concerning spirituals, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. All right, so here comes the first passage. I have, do have some of them I'm going to put on the screen that are, um, that I want you to compare. Okay, so we are comparing here in the notes 14 verses 1 to 3, and then verse 37 of chapter 14. So, and also I notice I mentioned the subject of 12 verse 3, and I've circled the point that I'm looking at in verse 3. So let's just read these verses. 1 Corinthians 14.1, Pursue love, yet desire earnestly. Now, here again, spirituals. Obviously, to understand it in English, they've added the word gifts. So that's in italics. But especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to man but to God, but for no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. So here we see the same word. Desire earnestly, spirituals, okay? And then he mentions two, prophecy and tongues. Now all the way down to verse 37 at the end of the chapter. This is in the conclusion. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. Now, um, and then I also want you to notice in uh, verse 3, therefore I make, uh, 12, therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. So from just reading this context, these verses, what kind of spiritual gift is the main concern for the whole passage? Christy? Uh, Okay, prophecy. Christy is guessing. She's looking uncertain. I am not given an affirmative, so she's maybe more uncertain. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Yeah? Yes. So prophecy is a speaking gift. That's true. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> right. Right. Okay, all right. Okay, Debbie? Okay, speaking gifts. Okay, now I guess we have to sort of have the whole passage in mind. Chapter 12, uh, we read a little bit further this morning in the, in the service, and we went to verse 13, I guess it was. And in that, those verses, he listed a whole lot of different spiritual gifts, right? And then there, he's actually going to go down, I don't know how familiar you are with these chapters, later on in chapter 12, he goes through the list again. And so besides, uh, okay, so prophecy and tongues are part of those gifts. But he also talks about healing, interpretation of tongues, discerning of spirits, Teaching, okay? So those are also spiritual gifts. But, so those are the, there's many different kinds of spiritual gifts. Uh, chapter 13 has to do with an attitude we're supposed to have. And he does mention spiritual gifts. If any man speaks with a tongue, it does not have love. Okay, he's, um, I'm not sure if that's the clanging gong. But anyway, you know, you know the passage, right? And then chapter 14. What is talked about in chapter 14? Prophecies 1. 
Speaking in tongues is the other. You see, so the issue was speaking gifts. Well, you're right, and you're both right. But in context of uh, what they were doing in Corinth. Okay, so what's the difference between, uh, let's see, what's the difference between speaking in tongues and speaking prophecy as a spiritual gift? Right? That's right. So when you speak in tongues, people don't understand when you're speaking prophecy. People do understand. All right, so Paul puts a value on which one? Prophecy. prophecy. He says, it is better. I would rather speak, we're sort of getting ahead of ourselves into chapter 14. I'd rather speak one word in prophecy than a thousand words in a tongue or something like that. Remember that? So he values prophecy over tongues. So what were the Corinthians abusing? Tongues. So primarily this whole passage, in terms of what he's addressing, is their abuse of the gift of tongues. Okay, Lee? Uh, well, we haven't got that far yet. Okay, he's asking a question. When we say tongues, are we talking about language of the people or are we talking about something else? We haven't got that far yet. We will answer that question. All right, Lola. Uh, it can it can be uh, it can be uh, that will also be defined at a later point. Okay, I, I do think he touches on that at some point. Either might be in chapter fourteen or somewhere. I'm not sure. All right. So just second, uh, I forget. Who, I didn't see who was first. So I'll try, start with Lola. Ladies first here. Okay, go ahead. Oh, sorry, too many, too many similarities. We have, and then Addie, where is she here? She was here. Oh, there you are. And your kids, it's like all those names are so this, much the same. I, I'm, I'm trying to get them down. Anyway, go ahead, Tola. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody understands. So the, the, that's why the 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 prophecy is valued higher. Okay. Le yeah. Yeah, um, yes, I think that's true. Uh, you're still ahead of me, so I don't want to get there yet. <laughs> All right? So I want to note here, I've got a couple things in my notes that I have not put in your notes. Um, the, there is some indication that this word spiritual is a, is a word that... Um, uh, is sort of a technical term in Corinth and, uh, and is used to refer to the people who are speaking in tongues. Uh, the uh, uh, order of the speaking in tongues itself. Right, so I have a quote here from one of the commentaries. He says, Paul uses their language as in 7.1, but he does not necessarily give it the same meaning as they do. So, so, in other words, what he's describing here, there's a suggestion that this term spiritual, uh, in uh, now concerning spirituals in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, now that the spirituals have to do with the people, not just the gifts. That's their term. Somebody who is speaking in tongues, he's a spiritual person. This is a suggestion. It is not conclusive. Nothing in the text proves this. Okay, but let me give you a couple of other verses that might lend support to this idea. Okay, so that is 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 15. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. So a spiritual person has some discernment, is what he's saying. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. But I, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual, 
men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. He's saying, look, you Corinthians, you think you're spiritual. They say a spiritual person is somebody with discernment. But you Corinthians, I can't speak to you that way. You are not a person of discernment. And then now he comes to chapter 12 and verse 1. Now concerning spiritual, spirituals, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. So this possibly, I put my, my next question as uh, who does Paul refer to in these verses? The same term. And in these verses, in, in 1 Corinthians 2.15 and 1 Corinthians 3.1, he is referring to people, for sure. So the possibility is that in verse 1 of chapter 12, he is also referring to people. And the commentaries think perhaps this was a label that they put on those people who spoke in tongues. They were the spiritual ones. Paul's saying, you aren't spiritual. So he's picking up on their term, but he wants them not to be ignorant about this term. Now, I do have a little note in your handout where I put compare 1 Corinthians 2. I put 2.1. That should have been 2.15. Okay? Just so you, in case you come back later, don't... I caught it before I... Uh, but I'd already printed the sheet, and I, I, <laughs> I didn't want to waste any more paper. <laughs> all right. So... All right. So now... Uh, I have a quote, and I believe I put this one in your notes. In light of the larger discussion of chapters 12 through 14, it does not appear that the, Christ, the Corinthians posed a general question about spiritual gifts per se, but rather that the issue had more to do with manifestations of inspired speech by local prophets or those deemed spiritual persons. In other words, in these chapters... The primary concern is what it means to be spiritual in the context of public worship. So in other words, what was, what, we're, we're painting a picture of Corinth that there were people there who were speaking in tongues and sort of swaggering around the church that they were spiritual. Okay? All right? And there were, uh, there were also some prophets in the church, of course. And we do know that these guests were current to some degree, in the first century. That we're not disputing at all. Okay, but what was going on in Corinth is that there were people who were, and we do know this to be true, there were people who were infected with pride in Corinth. We've been going through the book of Corinthians, and we can see, yes, they were. That's part of the issue. Lee? That's right. There could be demonic influence, but but we aren't going to come to that conclusion yet. <laughs> All right? I'm being very slow. I'm being very careful. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to get rid of those verses. Um, so how are they ignorant or unaware of spiritual gifts? They're obviously quite enthusiastic about spiritual gifts with an emphasis on the gift of tongues. So what is the nature of their ignorance? So this is a question. This is a, to provoke your discussion and thought. What do you think the nature of their ignorance is? Okay, so so they are thinking that the speaking in tongues uh, edified the church and made the church strong. Okay, uh, Christy, or who was it? You did you have your hand up? Yeah. Okay. So, what the purpose of the gifts were? I think we could also add the nature. Like, what are the tongues? What are our tongues uh, in terms of those gifts given by the Holy Spirit? So we go back to first uh, to Acts chapter two, uh, and we realize that in Acts chapter two there was a gift of tongues that were given to the Christians at, at Pentecost. Now, what was that gift in Acts chapter two? They are speaking in languages of the people. Yeah, the people could hear the languages spoken and they were amazed. How do these Galileans know my language? 
You know, like they haven't been out of Galilee or you know, other than Judea. So how do they know my language? They probably spoke the foreign languages with a Galilean accent. I'm guessing. I don't know. <laughs> right? So, so that, but, but in that case, it's quite clear what the tongues were. Now the question is, what was going on in Corinth? They were ignorant of the nature. I put in here, ignorant of the nature, purpose, and use of tongues. Though they think they are well informed about them. They think they're... I mean, these Corinthians are, are, are quite full of themselves, is the picture we get as we read 1 Corinthians. They're, they really think they've got it down, and they argue with Paul all the time. And it's quite a remarkable thing. Uh, we should be learning from the apostles, not instructing them. So, uh, why are tongues the Corinthian fo focus? What key distinction makes tongues more attractive than, say, prophecy or healing? Okay, what, what is it about tongues that would make the Corinthians think, yeah, I want that gift? Yes, Christy? It's not really provable. That's exactly it. Cal, are you going to say something? Right. Okay. So then they have. I have a direct pipeline to God. That's right. Okay. So that's two things. It's not provable on the one hand. Okay. So somebody is speaking in a tongue, supposedly, and you say, "Oh no, that's fake." Well, how are you going to prove that? Now, if somebody says, "I have the gift of healing," can you tell whether or not it's fake? Absolutely. Right. And if somebody says, "I have the gift of prophecy," and he starts mouthing heresy, you know he doesn't have the gift of prophecy. Right. When he says, I have the gift of tongues, and he just makes a bunch of noises, and you say, oh, wow, you're really spiritual. <laughs> okay, Lee? There are instructions. We will get to it. Oh. <laughs> Lee, you're just, you know this all. You want to get ahead of me. All right. Yes, yeah. And remember, these are people, we are very critical of the Corinthians. Okay, we have the whole Bible. They, they had maybe, they had the Old Testament, they had maybe Matthew and James and maybe Galatians. Okay, not much else. All right, so Lee's next. Ah, uh, okay, we're not to that verse yet. Hang on. You just, you want to rush ahead of me. Yeah, yeah, it's on the screen. Okay. Okay, so uh, Rob, whoever you are. Yeah. Uh, so this is just a question that came to mind. I wonder if it's been asked before. Like, so in Acts, of course, this is at Pentecost, uh, and where uh, the apostles were involved. Now we're sometime later in Corinth. Yes. Is it, are they saying at this point that, oh no, tongues aren't a known language? I'm just making my. Well, there is some there is some indication that they were speaking in an unknown language. I think some of the verses later on will seem to indicate that. Uh, but but uh, I think the argument that Paul makes uh, is sufficient to identify that biblical tongues are known languages. Okay, if God does give the gift, it is a known language. But again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Society is they use the word interpret tongues. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is that if that's like 1611 English, really we'd use today translation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think you're right that it should be translation, but I haven't actually looked at that word. Okay. So, we're, but you're you're ahead of me also. So you're being like Lee. So that's why I confused the names there. Okay, so uh, verse 2, what is the Corinthian spiritual background? Paganism. They're pagans. All right, so the pre, they're, and I have a couple of quotes for you here in the notes. Their previous experience gave them no background to distinguish, distinguish the true and the false. And I have this interesting quote from an article in Bibli Bibliotheca Sacra 
a very well-known uh, conservative uh, theological journal. This fellow, uh, what's his first name, Wayne House says, the mystery cults of the empire were designed to induce both higher and lower forms of ecstatic feeling. Okay, so ecstatic feeling, keep that term in mind, we'll come back to it. The expression of the ecstatic state took various forms, such as gashing one's flesh, dancing nude in a frenzy, and speaking in ecstatic utterance. Now we're talking about the mystery pagan religions that were current in Corinth at that time. Okay? The latter was the means whereby the devotees sought to have communion with the saving deity. Here the significance of the term glossolalia, or speaking in tongues, comes to the fore. The gift of tongues and of their interpretation was not peculiar to the Christian church, but was a repetition in it of a phrase common in ancient religions. The very phrase glosses lalain, to speak with tongues, was not invented by the New Testament writers, but borrowed from ordinary speech. So what he's saying in this first quote is that in the first century Corinthian uh, environment, there were uh, pagan religions who included in their worship sort of frenzied giving of themselves to the God. Sometimes this involved alcohol or drugs to get themselves into a state. And, and he, he describes all these practices. Uh, there is... There is in, sometimes in animistic religions, so those that we would say they're, they're, they're idolatrous, they're following some god, some local god, but often in the ceremonies, people will get themselves into, all, they'll work themselves up into a state of frenzy, and then they start making all kinds of strange sounds. And this was called glossolalia, the speaking in tongues. You are, you are communing with the God. You'd enter into a spiritual state so that you are sort of, it's almost like you're demon-possessed, and probably in the pagan religions, they were. And they start saying, making all kinds of wild noises. And, and people, oh, he's talking to the God. That's what they'd say, you see? And that is what was going on outside of Christianity. This was actually happening in the pagan religions. Second quote from the same author. With the Ex, uh, ecstasism, that should be uh, there's some kind of typo there, of Dionysianism and the emphasis on uh, tongue speaking and oracles in the religion of Apollo, it is not surprising that some of the Corinthians carried these pagan ideas in the church at Corinth, especially the practice of glossolalia, for which both of these religions are known. Though the Dionysian cult did not include the interpretation of glossolalia as did that of Apollo. Okay, so Dionysius, uh, I believe that's the Greek name for, in, in Latin, is Bacchus, the, the god of wine. So as they, one of the problems with, with their worship, of course, is it does involve alcohol. And it does involve getting out of your head with alcohol. So as people imbibed, they would get more and more rowdy, and part of their rituals and so forth would produce these states of ecstasy, and it would be very thrilling, and they'd make all these noises, and the Dionysians didn't care whether they interpreted it or not, partly because they were probably too drunk to even understand what they were doing. The religion of Apollo was slightly different, but it also had this, uh, this ecstatic experience. And you have uh, at Delphi in uh, Greece, there was the Oracle of Delphi. And they had a large snake there, was the emblem of the god. Uh, that's enough for me, no way, <laughs> I don't want any part of this. And they had a woman, who should get replaced every few years as, the, as uh, these women would age and die. But this woman would become the Oracle of Delphi, and you'll see this referred to in ancient writings, and, and uh, generals and kings would send, either go themselves or send an emissary to the oracle to find out whether or not they should fight a battle or not. And this oracle, this woman would get it, would be in this ecstatic state and would utter sounds, and then the priests of Delphi would say, okay, this is what she said. Okay? Okay, so, so this 
kind of um, behavior was not unknown to the Corinthians. That's the point we're making. Okay? Okay, in their previous experience in verse 2, which way were they led spiritually? Yeah, okay, what's the word that we see in our text here, though? Yeah, well, they're worshiping idols, but there's a particular word about the leading. Astray, all right? They're led astray. Okay, like wandering sheep. So led astray has the connotation of being led away by force, actually, as if against one's will, to a bad place you don't want to be, like your execution. Acts twelve nineteen. when Peter uh, escaped the prison, the... Uh, the uh, two guards who were watching him were led away and killed. <laughs> okay, you don't want to go there. So there's, the sense is being led away by force. Okay, the filling of the spirit is not the same as pagan ecstasy. All right. So people will say, "Well, okay, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that's sort of it's sort of like demonic possession." No, it is not. It's not at all like that. The Holy Spirit does not possess you; He indwells you. He enables you. To do what's right. He enables you to follow God. But he does not possess you. And control your will. Okay. The spirit fills. But does not carry away or lead astray. Okay. So that's a big distinction. So what is the test of discernment in verse 3? See. Well that's it's connected to that. So what is the difference? There's two different statements here. So what is, what is he talking about? What would we call those type of statements? Well, okay, so if somebody... Well, maybe I should just give you my word. Okay, I'll give you the answer. How's that? Proper confessions of faith. Okay? Yeah, didn't have enough blanks. Well, the thing is... Okay, so it's a confession. You're saying something about Christ. Right? Uh, let's compare 1 John 4 1 here. I have it on the screen. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So, there is. Uh, oh, and I should have gone on to the next couple of verses. It says later in that same passage, the person uh, who. Uh, let's, I'm going to turn there, because I want to say it right rather than. Just go by memory, which is faulty. Okay, so 1 John 4, by this, verse 2, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So uh, it is the, there, there is a distinction between things people say. Some people in the Spirit, they're, if they're in truly in the Spirit, if they're truly spiritual, are only going to say, that which is true about Jesus Christ. That's the point I'm trying to make here. The person who is, who is confessing, but if, now, the, the uh, and so, um, so if somebody's in an ecstasy, okay, uh, he, is, he is saying, uh, he's saying that there is a, dis I guess what he's implying is that there is a distinction amongst those who speak in tongues. Some are under the influence of the Spirit, some are not. I think is what he's trying to get to. We haven't got that far yet, but he's sort of opening that topic. Okay, Christy first, and then Addie. So I think following what you just said, is there an implication that some of the people who are speaking in tongues are actually saying what they're saying utterances? It's possible, yes. It's possible they are making deviant utterances. Okay, so if they were being... Okay, so because tongues are easy to, to, to uh, falsify, it could be that some of the Corinthians, maybe not all, but some of them were actually being led by evil spirits and were saying false things, even though nobody could understand them. All right, Addie, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Exactly. How do we discern that? That is the question, and that okay. So, and that is why uh, 
we have to, we have to understand the whole teaching here. What is Paul saying about tongues and and prophecy? And then and then also we have to consider the kind of life that comes out of those individuals. Christy, you seem like you have some Eureka. That's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So Paul does later on require interpretation, right? And he, the thing is, if it can't be interpreted, we are to keep quiet. You'll see. Okay. Right. Yes, and we shouldn't allow it in the church if somebody attempts to do such a thing. Now there isn't. There are other things that we believe, because we believe that these, these sign gifts, we'll get to this later, I just want to say this now though, these sign gifts were apostolic gifts, they were in the apostolic era. We believe, I teach, that those gifts have ended when the apostles died out. Okay. Now I, I'm just going to make that statement now, I'm not going to prove it. Okay. Later on we'll get to that. Okay, all right, so let's see what else do I have. What if a prophet has a sensational gift but doesn't make the prophet... Con okay, so okay. So we've got somebody in the, in the assembly who comes along and, he's, and in his prophesying, he is saying false things. But he has a sensational gift of some kind. He can speak in tongues. Okay, what do we say about him? He's not speaking prophecy, all right? I would say he's doing the, more the work of Satan than he's God. All right, he's doing the work of Satan then, and he is doing the work of God. So just because somebody is displaying a sensational gift does not mean they are in the Spirit. The test, the first, the test is, what do they say? So if they're teaching, if somebody is teaching orthodox doctrine, well, then there's a little bit more weight to his experience. But if somebody is teaching false doctrine, then you cannot credit his experience as being from the Holy Spirit. And I think that's what Paul is getting at here with these two confessions, the false confession and the other. I have another quote here. This one comes from, actually it's a man named Plummer. It's quoted by uh, uh, Edmund Hebert. He says, about all such things, this is not in your notes, about all such things there are two possibilities which must put us on our guard. They may be unreal, either the delusions of fanatical enthusiasts or the lies of deliberate imposters. So the tongues can be faked. They are either, maybe it's just somebody who's a little bit, you know, one of those guys that's a little bit fanatical and a little bit, you know, he just goes and he can't trust anything he says, right? Or the lies of a deliberate imposter, somebody who is just trying to, to gain a position because he has a sensational gift and he's trying to get a hearing. Okay, and then he says, even if real, they need not be of God. Miraculous powers are no absolute guarantee of the possession of truth. So it is possible for demons to imitate the powers of God. I'll give you a biblical example and then a testimonial example. Not of my own uh, seeing, but of a preacher I heard uh, talking about his own experience. So the biblical example is the prophet, or the, uh, the priests in uh, Pharaoh's court. Moses threw down his rod, it turned into a snake. The, uh, he turned the wa some water into blood. The, Egypt, the magicians of Pharaoh did the same thing. Threw down their rods, they became snakes. Only problem was, Moses' snake ate up the other two snakes, which must have been quite hilarious to watch. Uh, and then Moses picks it up, and now he's got all, I wonder if it was heavier. That's what I always wonder. It was heavier. Anyway, he's got his rod back in his hand. All right. So they, but these, these demonic priests of Pharaoh were able to imitate a work of God. Now, the, Experience one, uh, I heard a missionary uh, uh, leader speak about being in a service somewhere in Africa, 
And they asked him to go to, to come to this. There was something in a village where they were practicing some kind of um, you know, pagan religion. And he claimed to have seen somebody levitating across the ground. That means hovering over the ground. I mean, that's not the Spirit of God. Okay, so that's why we have to be very cautious about these kinds of things. All right, Lee, you are trying to get in there. I don't like that term, but I'll... I'll... <laughs> okay. That's right. Right. Well, okay. So, so uh, first of all, uh, I just want on the word tares. That comes from the parable. Remember, it says there, the field is the world. Okay. Okay. Just, just. I always want to caution people because they often get that wrong. Okay. But it is true that there, it is possible for people to come into the church, learn the lingo, act like they're Christians, and not be Christians. Okay. All right. That's right. And and if we got a pagan culture in Corinth, do you think there are people who just want to cause trouble and who say, oh, yeah, okay, I can do this? And they get in? Sure. Uh, yeah, it's relatively, it's, this is AD 55 ish that Paul was in Corinth, probably about 10 years earlier at the most. Oh, yeah, mostly. There's, there's Jewish converts, but mostly, mostly Gentiles in, in Corinth. It's a really that's part of the problem. All right, go ahead. Christy. Well, I think of the example in scripture where Paul and Martin were Christians, but they weren't really Christians. And that's they struggled with that. Yes. And they you know, really were Christians, but they didn't really have any yes. faith. Yes. And so for that reason, there's other people that thought there was a much harder thing to discern Yes. That's right. She was saying these men are the servants of the most high God, yes. And they, they commanded the demon to come out of her because they did not want the demon to be testifying to Christ. All right, so let's, let's just hurry on. Oh, Cal's got one, and then, okay, then go ahead. Well, okay, I was just kind of looking at what the demon here. Yes. And I was kind of wondering, to summarize, it looks like you're saying that uh, one who speaks in a tongue doesn't speak to men, speaks to God. Yes. That's right. Then go on to uh, what we prophesied to men. Yes. Yeah. So then Paul does say in 5, verses 5, now I wish you all spoke in tongues. At first, in other words, I'm assuming he's saying I wish you would all speak with God. Yeah. And then he goes on, but I wish you would prophesy more. Right. That prophecy is from God to the speaker. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So he he's not he's wishing that they would all have a, a close walk with God, receiving gifts from God. So even if and if they if God gave them all the gift of tongues, that would be great. But he says it would be even better if God gave you the gift of prophecy. Okay, so that's what he's saying. All right. So let me just um, I want to finish up because we are a bit over time. What does Paul mean by offering these competing confessions? Does he suggest that the Corinthians themselves are offering such statements? possibly in their ecstatic utterances. How many Corinthian Christians would affirm Jesus is Lord? So I'm not going to ask for you to answer. All of them would presumably, affirm that, like he's offering these things. So all of these people are saying Jesus is Lord. So if all the Corinthian believers affirm Jesus is Lord and that meant they were all filled with the Spirit, would they gain any spiritual distinction by experiencing Ecstatic speech. Okay, let's think about what I'm asking here. They're all believers. Now he says, therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now every one of those people in Corinth are going to say, well, yeah, I would say Jesus is Lord. That comes from the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, that means every one of them are spiritual. Okay, now, back, now concerning the spirituals, if that's talking about persons, and we're proposing that part of the problem in Corinth is that they were looking up to 
the people who spoke in tongues as people who were somehow more spiritual than the rest. And in the modern charismatic movement, that is a problem. They will teach that unless you speak in tongues, you aren't filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul says, if you confess Jesus as Lord, you are, that comes from the Holy Spirit. So the speaking in tongues is no distinction. It doesn't make you any closer to God. All right? I've just got one more thing I want to read, and then I'm going to let you have a last crack at it. Okay, regardless, their emphasis and practice put them in spiritual danger. They were vulnerable to false prophets who might have sensational gifts, and they were open to conflict and pride in thinking that some were more spiritual than others. Okay, so this sets the stage. They have a, they have a pagan background that has this kind of experience in, its, in the community, and they are vulnerable to people who come in who show these types of gifts and could lead them astray. All right, so Lee, one last thing from you. Yeah. Well, okay, there would be, I get the sense, not everybody, not all of the Greeks believed in this stuff. But there were these little cults, or not sometimes fairly large cults, the cult of Dionysius, the cult of Apollo, uh, these, these religions. They were in Rome as well. Sometimes some of the Roman senators and whatnot complain about their wives following after some of these other religions, and there's some really sensational stories. And there was a lot of foolish behavior by certain groups in the, in the community. So some of these Corinthians are converts and have been part of those groups. But what Paul wants to do in Corinth, he doesn't want this to just become another mystery religion. He doesn't, he doesn't want them to be, you know, just like, well, they're just like those Dionysians or they're just like those Apollo followers. They're, he wants them, you have to be, everything has to be done under order. So this emphasis on speaking in tongues by some at least in Corinth, as a spiritual thing, is uh, it, it has the potential of branding the Christian church as just another mystery cult. And he wants to guard against that. And that's why he called that girl down. Yeah, okay, uh, Marlene. Well, certainly he, he had much more ability than, than the Corinthians did, but uh, when he emphasized speaking in tongues, we will get to this, but I think we can show that biblical tongues, according given by the Spirit, are known languages. They aren't just some kind of spiritual ecstasy. That's part of what's going on here. There's two things going on in the mix. A spiritual ecstasy and an unknown babble, and actually being led by the Spirit and speaking in an unknown language for the purpose of evangelism. Okay, so we'll stop there. We are about six minutes over. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the day you've given us. Thank you for this opportunity to study. Lord, there's so much to talk about and a lot to absorb. We do pray that you'll give us patient spirits and also in our own expression of what we're saying that we will be clear. We pray that you'll help us in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.